JR, name a common opioid. Heroin. Now imagine you became addicted to it. Okay. Then imagine your drug of choice was spiked with a deadly drug fentanyl and you overdosed. Well, I'd be dead, so I can't imagine that. This is what's happening all across Canada. I've got that dish. Thousands and thousands of people. That, Maybe not that. how it began. Because that's a hypothetical. That dish. Definitely how it began. Hey y'all, it's Onika. And JR. And you are dishing with Dainty Dish. How are you doing today, JR? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing good. That's good to hear. So, um, I wanted to give you that imaginary scenario because I've been reading up a lot about the, uh, I've been reading up, sorry, about the Canadian uh, opioid crisis. There's a Canadian opioid crisis. There is a Canadian opioid crisis. Similar to what's going on in the United States right now, um, theirs is at a larger scale. Um, Last year, about 64,000 people died uh, in America, but in Canada in 2018, 4,460 people died of a a suspected uh, opioid overdose. Can you say that number again? 4,460. Okay. That's like what? I don't know. I mean, it's a fraction of the people, let's say, that died of cancer last year. It was 30% of the population uh, the, that passed away that would have died of cancer. But the reason it's, I would consider it, or in my opinion, it's a crisis because people are literally poisoning themselves. In 2017, 11 people were dying a day of opioid overdose. I mean, it's like just over one percent of the population. Uh, I don't know. I you, you can't. I can't really say something's a crisis without knowing how many people die per day. Like that's really the big. Eleven people are uh, dying per day. It's up to twelve no. now. Well, well, that's irrelevant if I don't know how many people are dying on a whole per day. On a whole per day, okay. Right, like you could just you could tell me a um, hundred people are dying a day of um, their hair falling out. Um, but if that's that's not a big deal, if I tell you two million people are dying a day because their hair is turning green, you know, like so. I mean, you gotta you gotta give me something to to compare it to in, or, in order for me to understand. Make like even 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 just attempt to say it's an epidemic because I just don't understand. I mean, crisis 11, a crisis. crisis. I don't a crisis. I mean, eleven people per day. Um, that's that's one, about 4,000 people. That's one person per province per day. I mean, I, 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 that's, not, that's, not, that's not a crisis to me. Well, I would say, as I said before, that it's a crisis because of the nature of, of what's going on. You know, the fact that people are ingesting um, opioids, specifically ones that are spiked with fentanyl, which is... Um, a very deadly drug. Um, it has uh, 50 to 100 times more uh, strength than morphine. And it's being put in these people's drugs. And they're, they're just dropping. Like it's, it, could, it takes like salt grains worth of fentanyl to kill someone. And it's going all across all socioeconomic backgrounds as well. We're not just seeing it in, in we are seeing it a lot in poor neighborhoods, but um, it could be it could be anybody you know. So is that why it's it's a crisis because it's now occurring to people outside of the the, the lower demographic? Is that because that is that where you're you're kind of is is that what you're kind of trying to you're trying to say? Well, honestly, honestly, it it very well could be it very well could be because I was looking you know during the course of my research I was looking at some of the um the information they had on Canada.ca. And they had this commercial um, that was dealing with stopping the stigma around opioid use. And it was 
you know, people who looked like average everyday people. You know, it wasn't like street people or, or people who might seem homeless or anything like that. It was average everyday people. One woman was sitting on her couch re- reflecting on the fact that it was her husband that passed away from opioid addiction. Um, another woman was talking about her son and she was in a very lovely living room. You know, so it could very well be the fact that it's now expanding uh, across socioeconomic lines that this is becoming, in, in Canadians' eyes, a, a crisis. It's still 11 people. I, I, I don't know. So let's look at the, let's look at, the, okay, it's 11 people, but let's look at the 4,000 people that are dying a year, and the number is actually going up. Um, 94% of them are accidental overdoses. So these people are dying. They're, it's not that they're consuming these, these drugs expecting that they're going to overdose. You know, it's completely accidental, and 73% of that um, had to do with fentanyl or fentanyl-related products. I want to talk about a politician who's been in the news recently. Um, This happened a couple weeks ago. I was, you know, kind of in my feelings, so I didn't get a chance to talk about it. Um, But his name is Jason Lewen. Um, He's Alberta's Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. And he was quoted to say after a conference, um, he was concerned that the distribution of naloxone uh, kits might be enabling greater drug use. Now, do you know what a naloxone kit is? No, I have no clue what that is. So it can treat opioid overdose uh, if given right away. It works works rapidly by binding uh, to the opioid receptors and blocking the effects of the opioid drug. So it um, it's a life saving game changer when it comes to the opioid crisis. Having these naloxone kits available um, to people who are are um, using substances, especially opioids. Um, They are available across the nation at Shoppers Drug Mart. You can go in for free. You can Google it and find your local um, shoppers, and you can go to the pharmacy and get one. Um, There are different sites around um, Toronto and surrounding areas, I know, that um, provide naloxone kits um, as a harm reduction strategy. Uh, And... Sorry, I was saying this. Um, Jason Lewin, gentleman, was saying that uh, it's it could it could uh, enable drug use in young people because young people will have the kit at ready once they're um, using their drugs, so they could push themselves to the limit of drug use because they know the naloxone is there to save them. He must have a constituency that has a lot of schools. <laughs> That sounds like a like a, a scared parent um, response. And they were parents that said. Oh, okay. <laughs> they were okay. parents. Okay, because it just it just sounds like a scared parent response. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm not a parent, so I don't know. I, I know. Like from my vantage point, I'm just kind of like, no, have the things there. Like it, it's kind of like condoms. You know what? Like. Yeah, like that war on, oh, don't talk about condoms versus talking about condoms. Yeah, like, 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 have them there. You know, like the HIV AIDS epidemic, it's not an epidemic anymore. Right? Like, <laughs> it's, r- it's real. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Let's have them there. That that's, But, I mean, he has to, he, he, he's, he's not, he might not be speaking for himself and his personal um, beliefs. He's speaking on behalf of, 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 of a group of people that, yeah. that elected him, right? So you can't hold him fully accountable for that. Like, the people that elected him said, no, this is what we want. And, yeah. if, all, and if all the parents are the ones that showed up to the, the committee meetings and, and the town halls to voice their opinions, um, then, you know, he had a social, social, social duty and obligation to, to voice that in. What, what level of government is he in? Um, he's uh, federal. Federal and federal. Well, I guess he's trying to keep a job too. Coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It's just, I guess it's just a scared. I think it's a scared mentality to have. Yeah, like fear mongering. Fear based. Um, yeah. You gotta have them. Just have them. Have them around. I mean, you're not. You're not necessarily going into the school and, and teaching the kids how to inject themselves, you inject each other with it. Um, and I don't know any kid that's probably going to have, going to go to Shoppers Drummer to buy that kit. Or to it's get free. That kit. 
How many kids, you know, will go to Shoppers Drug Mart to buy condoms or get a, or get a kit or get a kit to do something? Like they're just not doing None. that. So, like, if you're worried that 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 they're gonna have that to, to as as a like uh, fail safe, fail safe. Mm, do you remember being a teenager? Like, you just gotta ask yourself mm-hmm. that question, right? Like, do yeah. you remember being like, were you really gonna do that? Probably not. Yeah, one doctor in the article, uh, a Dr. Lang, said that 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 doesn't, he's like, that's not a thing. It's a drop in the bucket. He's like, yeah. that's a drop in the bucket. That's not, yeah. this is life changing. This is a game changer of for in regards to antidotes for what's going on with the opioid crisis. And that is just not a, a thing, is you know, basically what he said. And the whole reason that we're calling it a, a, um, an epidemic, not an epidemic, what you call it, a crisis, crisis, is because it's affecting the middle class, which are, and so, it's it's all it's going to be all no we don't want this until the kid one of the kids at school um is messing with it and and, and overdoses in, in in the lunchroom or in the hallway you know mm-hmm. in, somewhere in that's classes. not yeah you know and um then it's going to be we want them in every school we want that we want we want it to be in the office so that at any time we want to be in the office in the gym in the in the um in the first aid kits or with the defibrillator, so that we can use it. We know where it is. You know, then that's going to. That's where it's going. That's where it's headed. That's where know, it's headed. So that's where it's headed. It's going to be. It's going to be no, no, no until until it hits home, right? Yeah, but um, but yeah, you have to voice that opinion because that is an opinion. So it's cool. Like I mean, put it out there. At least someone said it. I mean, he. I mean, he probably spoke with the rest of his. Um, his party before actually voicing it in in within yeah the- it was during a round table okay um so he was repeating what he heard in oh, okay. the round table even okay. as um, yeah. spoke exactly. was so like, he's, he's just like Look. i'm just repeating what i heard like, like this, this is this he's is- like i'm a policymaker this is an interesting like idea i've never heard of this before i just and he was basically saying that um it's a fine line between like coming up with a solution that doesn't harm you as mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. so and he has to always take that kind of thing into consideration so i appreciated that for sure but people are coming up with all sorts of crazy ideas to um not crazy but um different ideas to, to combat the the current quote unquote crisis um i don't know what the definition of a crisis is i need to know the definition of a crisis you need to know google it um yeah doesn't give me anything real. Um, so the poll um, done by Angus Reid Institute um, of over 1,700 people. They were asked, uh, Canadians were asked, what would their approach to drugs be? But what's your approach to drugs? Like, what do you, what are you thinking? <laughs> what are you- <laughs> your sample size is 1,700 people. Great. That's a high school. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> like, these, these are the top three things they came up with, and we'll talk about them. Um, compulsory treatment. Yeah. Supervised injection sites and decriminalizing all drugs. Oh, yeah. Decriminalize all drugs for sure. And I say that because drugs are not a, if they're not a social, they're not a criminal issue. They're, um, they're, they're, issue. they're a social issue. And under that, they're a health issue. Um, so you don't throw people in jail because they have a health problem. Mm-hmm. Um, you help them. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Provide safe um, materials for people to use them if they're going to use them because it's really a, it's really a social issue. We need to we need to talk to people. We need to we need to try and people happy people don't do drugs. <laughs> so we need Very to true. we need to. Um, you're not going to be happy all the time, but we need to like show people that or help people that are in positions where you know. They're down to the luck, and they just feel that the drugs are the option. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, happy people apparently live in Portugal because in 2001 they decriminalized all drugs, and it wasn't the decriminalization of the drugs in specifically. Um, it was more that um, people with small possessions of, of illicit drugs were not um, given fines or jail time, were not given records for it. Um, so their crime rate has gone down at least I think it was 80 percent. I read um, since then, and they had a couple different facts attached to that. Uh, I'll throw the article in the in the um the bottom um but yeah uh and america's looking to do something similar i don't think they're looking to do something similar but there's like buzz around 
what about decriminalization of of illicit drugs? And there's buzz even in Canada uh, around it. Well, I mean, we did decriminalize um, marijuana or legalize marijuana. So, I mean, you know, there's 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 precedence, but um, that is definitely a softer drug. But um, you know, sugar's legal, so you know. <laughs> that's more addictive. Um, supervised injection sites, which uses the harm reduction method, which is the one that I think um, I would favor. I don't. I don't know if I would favor decriminalizing all drugs. I can't. I can't see as far as Portugal. I can't see as far as like how that's gonna necessarily help. Like I can't see that far for me personally. Well, if drugs, are, if drugs are readily, well, not readily available, but if they're if they're decriminalized, you're number one going to get people. You're gonna. We we know there's a connection between mental health and addiction, mm-hmm. and we've we've heard th- on multiple episodes, and we've heard in the media. You know, people have read in in in, in print that. A lot of times people with mental health issues also suffer from addiction issues and they end up in the penal system. And instead of being treated for the underlying problem, or which is an addiction to, to a, a drug, um, they're treated like criminals mm-hmm. and, they are, and, and it's for, they're institutionalized and they're made worse. So why not say, you know what? you have a health problem you have a problem that we can we know how to fix this like we know how to solve drug problems mm-hmm. we know how to solve them it's not something that we can't solve we already know the solution of how to solve pro- drug problems but there's this this barrier of 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 the criminal justice system that is is lying in between it because we don't give people the help they need until they've committed a crime and then they're thrown into an institution Mm-hmm. And then they're thrown in there, locked in there for an, an, an indeterminate amount of time, where we then decide to help to give them give them the the, the drug the clean the, the help they need with regards to their drug addiction. Mm-hmm. But then we let them out, and now they've got a criminal record. They they're not on drugs, but they can't find employment. They can't function in society. So what do they do? They turn they're back, back to, to drugs. drugs. Yeah. So you know what? Let's say drugs are not a criminal problem they are a health problem a social problem and then take that element out of it so that now when someone's on drugs we can help them right away we don't have to worry about if is you know is your child going to extreme lengths to get this drug you know if they're legal they're also going to be a little bit more easy to come by Mm -hmm. um which is also a challenge as well which means you have to also build your education system to to just say, say these things aren't cool. Um, but overall, I I think there needs to be an element of, of the decriminalization, the, the safe injection sites as well. Absolutely, mm-hmm. um, that definitely will work. Um, I mean, but then you're gonna have people saying, "I don't want that in my neighborhood." Exactly, that's exactly right? what's happening. Right, like I don't want that. In, I don't want that in my neighborhood. I don't want that here. I don't want that there. My mm-hmm. property value is going to go down. Mm-hmm. Right. No, mm-hmm. no. Make it somebody else's problem. Make it. Put it there. Put it here. Put it there. Right. So, I mean, and then you don't want to, and then you don't want to make them put these safe injection sites within hospitals because then you're going to um, bombard hospitals, hospitals with, with, with yeah. traffic. That that's that's probably not um, helpful. So, I don't know. I. I, I the, you're also going to free up the police, mm-hmm. like you're going to free first them up. You're, you're going to first responders. You're going to free them up to do to do their, to do other things. Like, you know, like now there's no marijuana um, issues on 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 in criminal issues out here in, in in Canada. The police have time to take care of you know looking out at the gun problem that we're seeing. Mm-hmm. You know, with the legalization of marijuana, you you're probably going to see underground listed organizations that used to traffic it try and move into other other realms because there's the cash flow on that might might mm-hmm. might, might might have decreased so there's probably there, you might you're going to have the police that are able to kind of focus their time on dealing with that and bringing those organizations you know no down mm-hmm. so yeah you got to look at the freeing up the first responders as well 
I think I've rambled on for quite some time on this topic. <laughs> I enjoyed it, though. It was but, good. So, uh, it yeah. was good. Um, you basically talked about the principles of harm reduction when you were talking there as well. Um, uh, just, I, got, I don't know fancy titles. Yeah, just, that's just, what it is. That was, okay. That's what it was. The pragmatism part, you know, drugs are going to be about. They're going to be about. Like, they're around and yeah. people are using them. Yeah. Um, so we should look at a more public safety um, approach um, as well as... Uh, human value um treating people not as their uh substance but as you know human pe- human beings that deserve dignity and respect and um lastly uh looking at the substance as secondary um and the actual harm that it causes as as primary when you're looking at your you're, you're looking into your care um so I, that's why I, I'm in favor um, of the of the the harm reduction uh, the the sites. Um, oh, they're also called overdose uh, protection uh, sites as well. I mean, I'll I'll be I hate to cut you up, but I'll be selfish. Like I live I live downtown, um, and I live in an area that there probably would be. A safe injection site. Yeah. Like, let's be real. I, I live in... There probably would be one. You know, here. I live in a place um, where there would and, be one. And... Actually, no, I wouldn't have a problem. Never mind. Because I, I, I just... Just thinking of it where I live, I know... I probably have an idea where they would put it. Um... And it wouldn't really affect me, which is kind of just like, oh, it's not yeah, in my neighborhood. Yeah, I know. I feel like I, I know that, like, I could Google it and there would be at least two or three in my neighborhood. Um, and I think it's a positive thing. Um, I think... Uh, See, I'm, I'm, gov- I'm not going to lie. I'm one of those not in my neighborhood. Not in my neighborhood. I mean, I live in the neighborhood I live in, though, so, it doesn't, you know... But it doesn't even matter. Like, like I'm, I, I can, if I, can, I had a choice, I can, probably not. I ha- if, if I'm being honest, I'd be like, not in my neighborhood. I don't mm-hmm. want it in my neighborhood. Probably not. You know. Probably not, but... Uh, I think the government isn't making it any easier, though. Uh, it's like, they're saying they're going to open up these safe injection sites or um, uh, supervised consumption sites, sorry, and... They're allowing provinces and territories to quickly set up overdose prevention sites. So they're allowing, they're giving them the honor of setting up their own prevention sites without any kind of government help whatsoever, other than their support. I mean, that's great. <laughs> Go for it. That's it, why. If you can find why, the space, why are you? See, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Okay, so the government's basically saying we're not doing this. <laughs> but the reality is, if you can come up with the funding and do it yourself. Go for it. We're not. We're not going to send police in there to arrest everybody. Like we're not to, to enforce the law. So mm-hmm. I mean, you you have to start somewhere. And they're basically saying, private sector, come in here, figure something out. Because at the end of the day, private sector is usually more efficient than the public sector at almost Fast. everything. So you and your selfish mentality, um, wanting everything. Sometimes you gotta like take what you're given and and run with it. And if this works, cause I, I was I was trying to bring up the um, the idea, the fact that, or not, I don't know if it was a fact, but I thought there was um, there was some makeshift ones that were up in our city, um, maybe like last year, um, and, yeah. they were, and they were they were pulled down. But I, th- I thought they were, I didn't they I didn't think they were causing any harm. I mean, I don't I don't didn't live near one, but. Um, were they harmed? Were they caused? Do you know? If no, they were there's any one. Harm? Um, there's oh, one still, that they, was, they still have yeah, them. They have they have the um, overdose prevention sites. There's one that I saw in a news article that's um, running out of Moss Park, um, uh, where people go for safe injection. Um, I know they have that one. That's kind of in my general sphere. Um, but I know we have them in in like quite a bit in in the Toronto area. So. Uh, the last one I want to talk about, which was overwhelmingly the most um, well, well received, was compulsory treatment. <laughs> and compulsory treatment means one of my favorites, uh, community treatment orders. So when you see something like a person who is using substances, you would recommend them to a place that has a plan for them to. Um, they would uh, see medical professionals. They would um, take medication, um, and they would be educated and counseled. And this would be compulsory. 
I thought you were joking. That's why I didn't even like respond. Like, no, like, this is legitimately what people think. Um, we should just pass them up in a in the back of a van and stick them somewhere and make. Essentially, them what you're saying is drugs. instead of um, taking them to prison, we're going to funnel them off into some sort of like camp. Yeah. Um, so we're separating. Uh, I don't like that idea. No, I'm uh, not a fan. I don't really. I mean, I understand why somebody would like that idea, or someone. If you've never been. Um, affected by you know mental health or addiction, you probably would like run for that idea. It'd be all 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 for that idea. Yeah, like um, why can't but, they just quit? Um, yeah, I mean sometimes I guess it's must, it's it's hard. I've 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 never suffered from addiction, so I don't know how hard it is to quit. But I but from from what people have said and how, what they've spoken about. Um, um, it's not a joke. So, if trying to, trying to force someone into that, and we know, but we know that you can't. For, someone's not going to get clean unless they want to get clean. Mm-hmm. Like we know this. Mm-hmm. Like we know on the mental health and addiction uh, side of things that typically, from what the, the medical professionals have said and what the people with lived experience have said. Um, I'm just basing this off of everything that I've heard. Is that you don't you don't get better until you want to get better Mm -hmm. so forcing someone into a a medical treatment plan is just wasting resources um, that could be better allocated somewhere else So that's what people think they, the, the top three uh, solutions for um, the drug crisis in people's opinion. So compulsory treatment, um, opening up uh, overdose protection sites, and getting rid of the law when it comes to drugs altogether. I like the way like I just kind of like randomly talked about those without actually coming up with my own solution. <laughs> Because I think if I were to come up with my own solution, it would be a hybrid of um, the um, decriminalize or legalize. Actually, you know what? I would decriminalize. Here, here's my solution. All right. Here we go. Decriminalize drug use. Keep drug trafficking and drug dealing illegal um, for those harder drugs. Um When it comes to prescription medications, um, incorporate some sort of checks and balance system. Mm-hmm. So instead of um, the doctor writing you a prescription and sending it and then giving it to you and then you going to the pharmacist, develop some sort of system where the doctor can... Um, post your prescription somewhere Mm -hmm. and you can then go to the um, pharmacist and have give the pharmacist some sort of number and that they can pull the Mm -hmm. prescription down and therefore there's a check and balance between how much you've been given and then that can there could be some sort of locking mechanism um, based off of whatever government regulation is for the most amount, the maximum amount of a certain drug that a, a human being could possibly mm-hmm. <laughs> consume. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can use, like, you know, measures like that through technology. Yeah. Um, They're still using yeah. the fax machine uh, for that. Like, often yeah. when I get my medication, I'll get a stamp. If I get, like, an actual physical prescription, they'll stamp it with the received uh, date or whatever. Um, so something like that, but more techy. Yeah, I would, I would probably be a better bet. And everything you talked about previous to that about um, uh, legalizing it—that's basically, as I said, what uh, what Portugal did and what we have done uh, is created the um, Good Samaritans Drug Overdose Act. Uh, it was created in 2017. Um, so people who were either overdosing themselves or involved in an overdose um, would not be charged with a crime. 
uh, if they called 911 uh, for like things like small possession of drugs. If they're sitting on bricks, then that's not the situation. But um, if it's, you know, you're calling in a 911 call for an overdose, uh, you're not going to be charged with, um, with uh, possession. So we have something in place that kind of helps reduce the stigma, I would say. Um, they're making the naloxone kits available. The government is. Uh, the increasing access to treatment. We've talked about access on this show before. Like, we've talked about access. And I don't know. I just feel like. There's not enough of it. There's Especially over, in like there's over thirty million people in this country and you're you're asking you're talking about what, four thousand? Like I, I just from like a numbers perspective, that number is it's it's significant. Hmm. I would say the deaths are significant. One percent of a population isn't significant. I think the problem is is that it's growing. Like it's growing. It's not just like it's one percent today. What's it going to be in a year from now? In two years from now? In five years from now? If we don't do something about the problem now? Well, the problem is people are being prescribed pain medication. So we need to have alternate ways of managing pain. Because well, we're not we're not talking about people dying from heroin overdoses, right? We're talking about people dying from um, prescription medications, right? No, we're talking or, or about people all together. Is it all together? together? Okay, even so, even so, if it's all together, regard. If, that number is not that big. I think, as I as I said uh, much earlier in in the um, show, I think the problem, especially just from my perspective, is. That 4,000 people last year died that didn't have to die because they were poisoned by a substance that has elevated opioid usage in this country to a crisis, okay. which is the fentanyl being put in the, in the opioids. Fine. What is the solution? How do we stop opioid an opioid crisis? The simplest answer is to stop prescribing opioids. To stop prescribing opioids, what do we need to do? We need to find another another method of providing people pain With relief. Pain management, yeah. So Instead of setting up all this infrastructure to manage this crisis that we're continue to continue to create, we have to look at the root cause. I just think it's just it's easy to say that because I've never been in that kind of pain. Like I don't know what that kind of pain feels like no, personally. No, I'm not, so I'm, I, no, no, I'm not telling people to. I'm not. I, I, don't, I think you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm saying that we need to find alternate ways of helping people manage their pain so that they don't they, you know, use opioids, like finding another method. I'm not saying the pain is, is not worthy of opioids. I'm just saying that we need to find other methods of mm-hmm. managing the pain. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. So whether it's to start out on opioids and wean people off, I don't know that, that part of the solution. But in order to solve the problem, we need to stop prescribing so many opioids. Yeah. You don't have an opioid crisis if you're not prescribing opioids. Not necessarily, because you still have an opioid crisis on the street. Yes, but people aren't necessarily... Gr- opioids on the street are inject Heroin you inject. Mm-hmm. People are not gravitating towards injecting heroin right off the bat.
the They're opi- taking the prescription the, stuff the, the, first. The, op- the opioid crisis is a crisis because middle, 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 middle Canada, middle America are falling victim to a set of pills, opioids. Mm-hmm. The pill side of it. Not the ne- not necessarily the heroin side of it, but the pill side of it. Mm-hmm. So let's take away the pills. Let's fi- let's 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 find other ways. Like I don't know through science, through through. I have no idea, but that's the that's where we have to work on. You're just throwing a bandaid on the situation by providing all these other extras, like a temporary solution. Yeah, because. What's what? What are these companies going to keep doing? They're going to keep pumping out opioids because they're they're corporations. They're here to make money. Mm. They're going to find new reasons to give you opioids. Oh, you got a headache? You know, take this Percocet. <laughs> take this Percocet light. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> oh my gosh, Percocet light. <laughs> you know, I I think with that we're going to end the show. <laughs> like, take a Percocet light, guys. Just. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you guys have any comments or uh, questions for me about the opioid crisis, what little I do know um, about it, I've shared with you today. So I don't know what I'd have to add, but just give me a holler. <laughs> JR, let them know how they can reach me. Yeah, definitely. You can reach Onika at dish, D Y S H, at daintydish.com. That's D A I N T Y D Y S H dot com. Uh, if you're listening on uh, Apple Podcasts, thank Give you so much. Give us five, you five. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Please subscribe. If you're listening to us on YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, or any other your other platform, please subscribe and thank you for your feedback. It's truly appreciated. Uh, yes. Uh, if we got anything wrong, if I make got anything wrong, please feel free to uh, message Onika. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a lot of facts today. A lot of facts. Yeah. Um, and I had no facts. Um, <laughs> I have no notes, no facts. <laughs> Off the tip of your top. This is just a random conversation. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, anyway, that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. All right. That has been the dish of the day. And I hope y'all have yourselves a very, very, very happy holiday.